So um, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce everyone on the panel. Um, just so everyone's aware, uh, I'll start with myself. My name is Mark Fuentes. I have uh, 15 years of uh, cybersecurity experience with posts in organizations such as Horizon Communications, the International Monetary Fund, the United States Department of Homeland Security, and ST Engineering. Today, I serve as a Deputy Director of Cyber Operations for Harang Harangi Cybersecurity, leading a team of world-class cybersecurity consultants throughout the uh, CN region. First off, we have Mohamed Nordin. He's currently the Global CISO with Circles Life, Asia's first fully digital telco and consumer company. Norden is responsible for building and maintaining the information security program and transforming the cybersecurity culture in the organization globally. Having worked in the government, MNCs, SMEs, and startups, he has accumulated more than 18 years of experience in cybersecurity, IT audit, risk management, compliance, investigation, and forensics. He's also an adjunct lecturer at, for cybersecurity at the National University of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, a board committee member for corporate governance with the Association of Muslim Professionals in Singapore, and the co-founder of a phishing simulation startup. Nordin holds a Master of Internet Security Management, coupled with certifications like the CFE, CFI, CISP, CISA, and CISM certifications. Secondly, we have David Wang. He's had over 10 years of information security experience working in public and private sectors and has experience uh, in building and executing information security programs. He's joined SPTEL in 2019 as the Assistant Director of Info Security and is responsible for all information security and compliance activities across the company. Last but not least, we have retired Captain Samuel Ng Chen Ying. He's currently heading the Cybersecurity Department of WeLab Bank in Hong Kong. Prior to his role in WeLab Bank, he held various positions including lecturer, red team and pen tester, and IT security auditor. He's also held multiple key roles in the Royal Malaysian Army and is frequently invited as a speaker on cybersecurity topics by the armed forces and universities. So I'd like to welcome all three of you. Thank you for joining. Um, just a reminder for all the participants, if you have any questions, they are welcome. Uh, just throw them into the chat. Um, we'll have a Q&A session after everyone's spoken. Uh, please, if you type in uh, a question, make sure it's posed to all panelists. Without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so um, for our first topic, uh, we'd like to talk about how in this current environment, we have uh, so many changes coming rapidly and so much innovation, which is leading to new threats, right? So I'd like to pose a question to all three of you. Um, what are your thoughts and what are your feelings about how organizations should be keeping up with these new cyber threats? Uh, I'd like to open up to Nordin first. Thanks, Mark. So basically the one thing I learned, right, about uh, cyber threats is that it doesn't slow down even during a pandemic like this. So my team and I, I had to like, even respond to two major threats uh, while working from home in this pandemic. But I'm quite happy that we are still able to respond decisively even while working remotely. So all of us are trying to uh, very hard basically battle this uh, global COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, there's an increase in cyber attacks globally that use uh, COVID-19 as a bit right, to elicit ill-gotten gains. So we have to watch out for that. And I've come to know that there are over 100,000 uh, newly registered domain names uh, that contain words such as COVID, oh, virus, corona. And this indicates that many malicious sites have been spin up uh, to drive unsuspecting users to these sites. So most probably by phishing emails, which is quite common, smishing and even online scams. So let's don't talk right, about the rise of uh, intrusion activities on some sectors through intelligence uh, reports and uh, sophisticated uh, devices. So as long as uh, there's emotions, humans will always be the weakest link. And cyber criminals will make that as a target. So with working from home, users will turn to, for example, like online gaming and uh, mobile applications to kill time. Right? And uh, as such, malware infected apps online are basically on the rise. So we have to be vigilant and download apps only from verified sources. So another, uh, think about uh, cyber threats uh, 
is about video conferencing. Now, uh, we are doing video conferencing much more than we previously did. So it's also another source of attack such as Zoom bombing, no malicious chat links, and unauthorized attendees uh, will be on the rise. So video conference or Zoom administrators have to be more vigilant uh, with the settings, with the configurations, especially misconfigurations, right? either at the workplace or even during social virtual gatherings. And uh, it is coming, Hari Raya is coming. Right? Uh, even myself, our family has already set up a Zoom conference to interact with one another. So this is something that we have to watch out for. So you do not want to have an unauthorized attendee, you know, attending these social gatherings with your own family members. So as uh, work from home now becomes a new norm, right? So companies turn to cloud as a core component of collaboration and speeding up VMs to scale. So almost everything now, right, are on the cloud. So data supposedly the new oil are all over the place, right, in the cloud, all over the place in the company. So this will be basically a playground for attackers to target and security practitioners have to pay uh, particular attention to these misconfigurations, access, and implement appropriate security measures on the cloud. So in short, uh, it is important that there is also a cloud security strategy in place right, to protect your workloads in the cloud. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I think um, a really good point that you're raising there is that um, the cyber threat landscape uh, has seasons and the external world affects that landscape as well. And we all have to look at cybersecurity as an ever evolving uh, challenge, not a uh, state of being. Um, to add on to that, I'd like to uh, turn over to David, if you could uh, lend some thoughts as well. Um, so basically for SPTEL uh, perspective, we look at um, two points. Basically it's from a left to right approach through threat modeling. Um, Second approach is about assumed breach position. That's from right to left. Now, whether is it a uh, trap modeling or assumed breach position, all right? The common points between these two strategies is all about uh, five points. First, know your, know your organization, all right? Yes, you got to start from somewhere, all right? Know your crown jewels, uh, know which are critical assets, all right? Um, a good point to start basically is uh, mind mapping, all right? Do the mind mapping, you know, talk to people, all right? The person sitting there for the past 20 years as a sysadmin knows everything, all right? So talk to them, engage them, all right? So point two, know your threats, all right? Um, when you talk about threat modeling, it's all about threats, all right? Whether is it a current situation where you have to work from home or you got to work from uh, any part of the world, all right? Know your threats, all right? Um, one point about knowing your threats is that you can't, you have to accept the fact that uh, you can't focus all of them, all right? So a very good point is to understand your threats that is relevant to your industry, relevant to your business sectors, all right? And look out for publicly available resources about threats, all right? Third point, prioritize and match them up, all right? You've got the list of um, threats out there, all right? Scope it down, all right? That's relevant to your asset, to your business, all right? Prioritize them, match them up, all right? Fourth point, make it actionable, all right? Again, I'm a very process person. I'm very mind map driven, uh, spreadsheet driven. So whatever works for you, right? List down the asset and map to the threats. That goes back to my point one and two. Last but not least, right? Repeat the whole process again. One to four, right? Go through this whole process again, okay? Um, um, make it uh, something that is part of your process, right? So so that's that's basically on, on, on my side, yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, I think. Um... That's, those are great points. Uh, one thing that you really highlight there is um, organizations don't have to start by spending half a million dollars on equipment or whatever. They could really start with a piece of paper and a pencil and write down what their, what their crown jewels are and what the threats are to those crown jewels. Um, it's a lot cheaper to start than people think. Um, Samuel, if you could uh, round us off. Yeah, sure. I wish to compliment on uh, Nordin's uh, speech, where it's about phishing attacks. Uh, well, we Lab Bank is uh, quite fortunate to receive a lot of phishing emails. So um, from our controls, we have actually blocked a lot of uh, phishing emails regarding of COVID-19. But then, uh, as an attacker myself, I understand that those hackers, they are actually walking extra mile. So 
their phishing campaign is not only really like creating a new domain and then send out uh, phishing emails. They're trying to hack into those uh, servers, like those uh, uh, small to medium businesses. So I can share one example that, um, uh, that we faced before, that the hackers actually hack into a German construction company, which is a small to medium businesses where their controls are really not in place. And they send the phishing email out from that server and it reaches our, our WeLab bank. So uh, besides doing the due diligence that we, we try to stop all these phishing emails, we have to, we have to actually uh, walk an extra mile like the hackers itself to defend ourselves, you know. So uh, from that part, while we as a cybersecurity professionals are fighting in the front line, we actually need the people in our businesses as well to act as a last line of defense. So um, we are actually uh, doing a lot of this uh, user awareness stuff because it only takes one email for, for the hackers to get in. You know, uh, uh, For us cybersecurity professionals, we are actually fighting an uphill battle because the hackers only have to be uh, lucky once. We have to be lucky all the time. So, that's what we wish to share as well. And for the second point, uh, I wish to compliment David's uh, statement where this, uh, this assumed breach. So uh, from what we let Bank does is uh, we go back to basic. It's like an army, back to basic, uh, zero trust model. So we go back to our PIM, our, our identity access management. So we try to achieve uh, a red forest uh, active directory uh, a governance control. So uh, it's like our team is building towards that. And uh, yep, another point we wish to, uh, I wish to compliment Nordin again, where you were saying about cloud security. Well, uh, NSA, the National Security Agency, has actually published a new uh, framework. Uh, it's called Cloud Security Governance uh, Framework. So I I wish to share to everyone that uh, we can actually follow the guidelines and to secure our cloud. So that's, these are the few points from Relay Bank. Uh, Mark, if I can add, right? Um, so basically, uh, just for everyone's information, I'm sure a lot of people know about this, that MCI and uh, PDPC has come up with a public consultation paper for the proposed amendments to the PDPA. So there's a couple of amendments there, and one of them is basically an increased penalty to 10% uh, of uh, overall uh, revenue turnover, right? Or 1 million, I think whichever is higher, if I'm not wrong. So that will definitely change uh, the landscape again and uh, place uh, more emphasis right, on uh, information security. Right? We, information security in Circle suddenly become top of the priority. Right, because of these proposed amendments. So it may happen to most companies. I think you raised a really good point there. Um, and I think the thing that springs to my mind um, when we're talking about um, our weakest links, uh, these new threats, right? Um, is there anything, uh, what would you tell the people on the call um, about how they should approach these two? Because we can't really put in these countermeasures without buy-in from leadership, right? What would you tell the people on the call about how to pose this challenge to their leadership? I open this to anyone who wants to. Okay, if if I can go, <laughs> right? Yeah, please. Um, yep. So so basically, um, I think the most like, like for example like in circles right um uh, the founders of course have to be prudent right um and uh, we have to basically uh be especially uh wary about the budget that we put forth uh, with regards to information security but at the end of the day uh the risk and the reputational uh damage to the organization is uh, of course very important and with the new regulations that uh, is going to be proposed, right, uh, with the increased penalty, and this will not only uh, affect uh, the financial standing of the company, right, or and also the reputation if 
uh, a data breach were to occur, touch wood, right? So, um, definitely in terms of uh, the work that needs to be done within the company, it's quite a lot, right? Um, you know, if I can say so, know your crown jewels, know where they are stored, know how they are being accessed, right? Uh, especially with regards to your data, your customer data, if you have, right? so, so on and so forth. Uh, but how do you actually go up to your founders uh, or to your management, right? And uh, tell your management that, hey, you know, I need uh, this resource. I need this amount of budget you know, because I need to do so many, 10,000 things right, to keep our organization, organization safe, right? So that, that is definitely a challenge. But uh, what I can suggest is to uh, let the management know about the uh, risk level, right? And the impact if um, there were to be a data breach, right? It's not a matter of if, right? it's a matter of when, right? So but how are we protecting ourselves against that? Right. And if there and when there is an impact, right, and when there's a data breach, right, uh, what kind of impact? You no, know, impact can be uh, reputational risk, you no know, financial risk, right? Uh, we will lose money, you no, know, one billion or ten percent of overall turnover, you know, whichever is higher, etc. So, uh, I'll, I'll come from the the risk and impact angle, right, uh, to uh, management, uh, to seek for uh, extra help, but if possible. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, I think um, that segues perfectly into the next topic. Um, it takes more than a man. It takes a village, right, to secure an organization. Uh, a CISO can't do it alone, can't go it alone. So um, our next topic is um, to ask you about what your thoughts are about the recipe for creating high-performing security teams. Um, I guess um, I'll, I'll give you a quick break, Norton. I'll go backwards. Samuel, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, all right. Um, I'll have four key points to actually uh, is my recipe for creating a high performance cybersecurity team, which means that uh, I maximize automation and coverage. I mean, uh, with, you know, uh, cybersecurity, cyber defenders job are a lot repetitive. So we try to leverage all this, all this uh, like automation stuff and to increase our coverage. The second thing is to uh, lead to a second point, which is uh, AI utilization. And then we try to acquire talents from the offensive side because uh, you want, if you ask the police to secure your house, it's a bit hard, right? You get a thief to tell you how to secure your house, that would be much better, right? And then we try to improve the defender's tactics towards uh, proactivity. So uh, having the tactics from the attacker side, it will help a lot on our defender side. So for our uh, high performance security team, we have uh, a few domains that uh, I categorize to actually build up my team. I will start with the security operations, which is point number one. Uh, that will include a red team, blue team, purple team, and stuff like that. Second one is a security architecture, where uh, cloud security design and stuff like that. The third part is the most important part, is a risk assessment. So uh, we have to see the cyber risk, like uh, data breach, the annual rate of occurrence, what is our ROI towards uh, the investment put towards these uh, cybersecurity controls. And then the fourth one will be governance. Uh, of course, frameworks and standards, policies, we cannot, we cannot neglect that. And then uh, threat intelligence, which is point number five. Uh, it, is, uh, it is one of our priorities to actually organize our threat intelligence because uh, you know those intelligence comes from different sources social media or maybe darknet and stuff like that so we have a team trying to organize all those information to actually assess our risks and then our sixth point is uh, career development I have to develop my team as well to keep them motivated to keep them uh, be happy in this cyber security industry and uh, or find people like me, which is very passionate about cybersecurity. And uh, the last one would be user education, which is what I said just now, uh, the last line of defense. Because um, uh, the most important part is, uh, is our business users. So I try to actually organize my team into this, all these eight domains. So uh, that's how I try to cover, to cover every domain in cyber, cybersecurity as much as possible. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, David? Yeah. Um, so I have um, basically three points to add. First point is that 
I view cybersecurity as a sport. Um, and I would take the closest sport to, is to be a boxer. All right. So knowing the sports of becoming a boxer doesn't mean that you just study the sports. All right. You got to go into practice. All right. And when you translate that to cybersecurity terms, basically is to train. All right. In a very safe simulated environment. All right. Next is able to go out and fight. All right. Fighting with your opponent. All right. Have better scars. I think um, better scars is important. All right. I have a, a fair share of my better scars. All right. Whether is it uh, script kiddies, APTs, or things like this. So, uh, and, and it changed my whole perspective towards cybersecurity. Whether is it from a defense perspective or, or from an attack perspective. All right. So, uh, view cybersecurity as a sport. Uh, keep it sharp. All right. Point two is about uh, cross train with other security department. Now, of course, the basis to this is that. Uh, you need to be in large organization where you have threat intelligence team, incident response team, site ops team, all right? Cross over to the other team for six to eight months, all right, to understand their processes, all right? Come back to where you originally from, uh, you are able to have more synergy and gel things up. I think uh, for this to work, uh, for this model to work, you need a strong support from HR, all right? And of course, the management. Uh, the last point is about data privacy, all right? Uh, many cybersecurity professionals, um, they are very good in their area of work. But I think there's an increasing trend to understand the regulation, legislation, uh, especially when you're working very closely as an advisor to DPO, to your legal team, to understand, uh, to safeguard the data. And um, you can have cybersecurity without data privacy, but the reverse is not true, right? You, in, in order to have data privacy to work, uh, you need the controls in place. So um, across to all the attendees or even to fellow panelists, I think uh, moving forward, understanding of data privacy will be a key factor moving forward. It's all data driven. Yeah. Thank you, David. Norden? Yeah, um, this is about high performing security teams, right? Building it. So um, I've been responsible to build uh, security teams and uh, run security functions for quite some time now. So I vividly remember my first job right, in the Singapore Police Force uh, with the IT security team. So my job was uh, uh, only to be responsible for access control and a crypto server. So I found that to be really mundane and uh, I told my manager that I wanted to do more. So fast track uh, to five years later when I left the Singapore Police Force. So I gained knowledge in security consulting, security audit, incident response, the experience administrating the firewall, security scanners, crypto, and a couple of security solutions. So uh, why I had that drive you know, to do more and uh, thirst for knowledge, and but most importantly, to take ownership and uh, accountability. Uh, and uh, there are three uh, characteristics I look out for. Um, and taking the ownership and be accountable is my recipe to create my team. So it's okay to actually make mistakes. You know, that's how uh, you grow. Uh, but most importantly, you pull yourself together and push forward. So I, I define my team uh, is high performing is when I'm informed uh, by my colleagues that they appreciate our work and see us as a critical function to drive the organization forward. So when I hear that we are a blocker, that is immediate red flag. So and we have to rectify the problem immediately. Why are we a blocker? So um, there is actually no one size uh, fits all right, in a security professional. Uh, you can hardly get a GRC professional who can do penetration testing. And you can hardly get a penetration tester who can do source code review. Right? But what's important is that you're able to complement their strengths with the other team members in your team. So I don't like silos. Right? I'm a believer of cross collaborative function. So by doing so, you not only enhance the skill sets of the individual, uh, but you will be able to produce a more quality output by synergizing the strengths uh, of the different team members. And uh, as a leader, if you're still configuring that firewall, executing that pen test, or conducting a cloud security review, you may want to relook really at your priorities as you might be, have been focusing right, at the wrong task to achieve your strategy objective. There must be a strategic objective uh, for information security. What you want the information security function to be Right, within your organization. And uh, the last thing right, I want to add here is uh, what kind of leader are you right, uh, to create a high-performing security team? Uh, whether are you a seasoned uh, executive or a neophyte uh, supervisor? Is your style cohesive, authoritative, 
you know, democratic pace setting, what is it? So most leaders tend to use only one style of leadership to lead their team. Now, however, you know, our team members are diversified, right? They have different skill sets, different mindsets, different experiences. So with regards to all these uh, personalities and their expectations, right? We have to cater the appropriate style uh, of uh, leadership right, to the individuals in our team. So a mixture of authoritative, you no know, democratic coaching, you no know, depending on the individuals in your team. So in in circles, we are also uh, very OKR based. So we are very outcome based, right? So we have a 30, 60, 90 day uh, milestone plan uh, for every individual in the company, uh, including even directly up to the founders, right? Which help to increase our ch chances of success in achieving our outcome. So it's a fast moving environment in that sense. So we, uh, in circles that we have an objective that we want to meet as a security function, uh, uh, is a, a very big objective, right? So uh, it will take tremendous hard work. Uh, there will be failures right, along the way. I won't deny that. But as long as we work together, remain focused on our outcome, like put ourselves together, we'll be able to achieve our uh, strategic priority together. Yeah, that's my take. Thank you, Norden. Um I think along the lines of what all of you guys are saying, um, there's a there's a fine balance to be uh, there's a balance to be had between uh, softer skills like attitude, um, um, accountability, you know, uh, leadership skills, and the hard skills that we have in cybersecurity, such as actually pen testing and uh, risk management and all of these skills. Um, when we look at people, uh, how organizations are hiring cybersecurity professionals today, we find that um, if they don't have uh, a cyber uh, a security leader such as yourselves to make the choices, they depend heavily on certifications. Um, my question I'd like to pose to the three of you is, um, how heavily should people be relying on these certifications? And does that mean if you can get a guy with a billion a billion starts at the end of his name. You don't have to screen him for, for personality traits, for how he might synergize with your other teammates. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? I can take on that. Um, how I actually uh, look at them is I categorize people by three parts, skill, knowledge, and attitude. So from what you say, uh, you, you can have a lot of certifications, right? Uh, but then, that's your skill and knowledge but attitude it's the last the most important part for a person to actually to excel in their career and uh certification is only like uh your car license uh you want to be a race car driver <laughs> yes of course you need a race uh you need a car license but how you actually drive the car it depends on yourself so for cyber security professionals uh it's not that you have the skills, you, have, you need to have the sense, like the attacker's sense. Then, you, then only you know how to actually uh, to protect yourself. You know how people are going to rob you. Then you know how to actually protect yourself. That's, that's my take on this. Um, maybe I'll chip in as well. I think um, at the end of the day, it's, very, it's able to articulate your thoughts, right? You can have a list of certification, you know, you know, whether you're in cybersecurity or, or in IT field, we are all very much certification driven. But I think one point is that um, when I ask questions to anyone that um, I'm going to hire, I will start off with a list of uh, very fundamental questions and articulate over, you know. And the second point is able to connect with people, all right. At the end of the day, it's about connecting with people. We know all the controls in place, but the ability to articulate your thoughts and connecting with people is the soft skill that we really need, right? Skill set or just skill set, right? But don't forget the people touch, yeah? That was really well put, gentlemen. Um, and with that, I, I guess um, we'll move on to the next topic. So um, we're, we're all um, weeks into this COVID, uh, COVID thing and uh, halfway into 2020. Um, and I'm pretty sure all of us are sitting down here and we're not at the place we thought we were going to be in January, right? So um, what are your guys' thoughts on um, the priorities that uh, people have to put into cybersecurity 
uh, for the rest of 2020 and beyond. Um, I, I guess I'll start with David since uh, I started with, you know. Yeah, sure. So I think um, going back to my first uh, uh, answer to the first question, I'll still go back and stick to my initial strategy. That is my trap modeling at assumed bridge position. Now, trap modeling has different dimensions, right? And trap modeling, basically, you tie back to your risk assessment. So basically, now the trap has changed, right? From a very office space, now you're back in the you know, BYOD space or home-based type of working. So your trap will change, right? So this is a chance for you to sharpen your trap modeling again and do your necessary risk assessment. And the assumed bridge scenario will be changed, right? From a very office base to home base. That's one. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, I'll go back to my data privacy understanding uh, is that you can't have data privacy without security control. I echo this many times um, back in my organization, back to my team. Uh, very important, understand the data privacy, understand the data flow, right? Be a trusted advisor to your key stakeholders. I think that's important. Thanks, David. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone. Uh, we have one question in the chat. We will uh, get to it later. But just reminder to everyone, you can post all your, all your questions into the chat if anyone has any questions. Uh, I welcome you guys to throw them in there. Please make sure it's um, to all the panelists. Um, and for the next, uh, I'll move on to Norden, if you could provide your thoughts as well. Right. So I think we have heard right, since recent months that uh, work from home is becoming a new norm. And I have no doubt that it will. So I got, organizations have come to realize that uh, they don't need fancy office in posh buildings in CBD, extensive travel, perks like all day snacks, we fully stock canteen you know, in order for business to conduct. And in most cases, effectively, right? So employees are claiming they work longer from home rather than when they were in the office. <laughs> for example, for myself. <laughs> so just a few days ago, now, I was having a casual chat with one of the department heads and he told me that he skipped breakfast and lunch. So that aside, no, the work of uh, CISOs and InfoSec functions will change. So how are we managing this change? As change will become some of new normal, right? Uh, nonetheless, now, if we see this as a positive change, an opportunity, right? This mindset will help to reduce the stress of the job. Right, CISOs need to have a strategic approach. Right, uh, cybersecurity functions need to have a strategic approach to tailor their security program and distribute their risk and develop resilience. Right, to support the business operations. So uh, the next thing is, uh, contrary to how a CISO should act, uh, I am actually a believer of flexibility, as uh, with flexibility comes creativity. Right? and be willing to compromise. You no, know, as we manage uh, enterprise level risk where the lines are blurred between what's acceptable and what's not. So having said that, right, we are still accountable to understand this risk and collaborating with our stakeholders, peers, uh, leadership teams right, to compromise and find a middle ground right, for remediation that is both acceptable for the business, but at the end of the day, meet the security requirements also. And being a CISO and uh, information security function is uh, not a one-man show. So we are building... Uh, in circles, we are actually building cyber champions right, in the different countries globally and in different teams where these individuals right, will rock the boat for us when it comes to security. They will be our trigger point, our switch right, when security is required and we will be there when activated. And uh, this is what I call engaging with the internal community to create a culture of trust. Right, and continuously educating our employees on the value that the security team provide to the business. And uh, cybersecurity also is not uh, just a technology. Right? Uh, we have to place emphasis on three areas. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer of people, process, and technology. Right? We need to have the uh, right people. Right? Um, we need to establish that process. And we have to have that technology right, to uh, uh, control that process. Right. So, no point for you to have a, a procedure or a policy, right? but you don't have anything that is able to control that. So, people will just violate the policy right? and you will just be a reactive uh, function. So, I, I place importance on uh, also on business value right? that will measure the cost of my security program. 
So this value measures the benefits right from uh, deploying technologies uh, versus the impact on business operations, regulatory risks, right? Uh, especially the risk reduction, customer and business experience must not be compromised. So uh, with all these approaches, right, I will be able to help the organization or rather we as a function, right, will be able to help the organization to uplift the maturity level, which is where we want to achieve. Right. So, so I mean, just to sum up, right, uh, some of these uh, priorities will already be there pre-COVID, right, but this flexibility, right, of catering this approach post-COVID uh, can help the organization to keep pace with future and new threats, especially when we are working from home. I really like that concept of uh, decentralizing the secure cybersecurity um, responsibility. Um, I think that's something that a lot of organizations uh, fail to do. They hire a CISO and they think everything's done. Uh, so I, I think uh, we should be reminding everyone that it's everyone's job. Uh, yes, exactly. Great point. Uh, Samuel? Yep, I have four points to share about these uh, cybersecurity priorities. So number one, I think it's the most important one, uh, it's to build a relationship with the senior management. Because a CISO can have a lot of fancy programs in place, but then if you come without the senior management support, uh, we can go anywhere. And the problem is there's always a gap between the CISO with the senior management because cybersecurity is a lot of all these uh, technical terms and stuff. So the CISO has to really uh, make, make the senior management understand the risks and stuff like that because cyber risk is one of the uh, most unpredictable risks an, an organization can ever have. So that's point number one. And point number two will be beefing up my security operations center. It's not like uh, we have an SOC, we are, we are safe. Uh, so what, what I normally do is uh, sometimes I just throw a malware and see how, how their response time, how do they respond to the malware that I really put in, yeah, you know, so, uh, and see how they escalate the thing. So I'm trying to beef them up. Uh, I mean, if they say SOC is good, like how good are you if I don't test you, right? So that's, that's what I usually do. And point number three will be multi-layered defense. I always believe in multi-layered defense because there are a lot of attacks that you cannot, uh, you can say you have controls in place and then you fix that problem. It's not that simple. Let's say pass the hash attack. Uh, you cannot actually stop that, you see? But then we can move into uh, different controls in place where we have good detection, we have good uh, response, we have good IR and stuff like that, multi-layer defense. So the last point will be uh, proactive and organized threat hunting and intelligence. We, we should be like the attacker ourselves. We go into hacker forum, we go into darknet to find, to find more information out of just, just all those threat intelligence you can receive from social media and news and stuff. You should just always walk an extra mile. That's what I think a CISO should actually put their priorities for 2020 and beyond. Great stuff. Um... So we've, uh, we've given you uh, three uh, leeway to talk about priorities. But if I was to ask the three of you, what's the number one top, top problem or challenge that a CISO faces today? Uh, what would you guys say it is? I'm, anyone uh, can answer. Uh, I'm not gonna... Yeah. Sure, so I, sure. Um... Basically, it's a constant challenge to translate technical term to business terms. I think that's that's very important. I think um, the sense towards business has to be sharp, right? Um, whether you are CISO or director or infosec doesn't matter, right? At the end of the day, is to follow and be the trusted advisor to side to business team. So having good understanding of business would be good. Um, keeping it sharp that would be important. Yeah. Samuel or Norton, yep. I want to weigh in. Yeah. Go ahead. Please, Norton, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think I have um, one point to make. Um, the most important or uh, key challenge, right, uh, that I am facing is to basically know where your data is. Yeah. The data 
is actually everywhere in the company, <laughs> right? So our job is basically to secure the data. And if we do not know where the data is, right, um, and we do not ha have the proper process to identify where the data, then uh, that will be a problem. Right. So um, this is what we are doing uh, in circles, uh, particularly to uh, go on a massive uh, exercise right, to identify where our crown jewels are. Right. And uh, we have uh, been quite successful in doing that. Right. Uh, the next step will be to secure these crown jewels. Right. And at the end of the day, when we secure these crown jewels also, it must be risk prioritization which are those crown jewels with high risk, low risk, medium risk, because you cannot basically uh, secure what I would say a uh, Pepsi recipe, right? like how you uh, secure your money in the safe at home, right? So um, you have to balance there. You know, it's very important to strike that balance. And that is one of the key challenge that I face. Uh, another thing is uh, to... Um, basically uh, have that um, collaboration right, between the different teams right, to get the buy-ins right, from the different teams. Um, I would say that getting that buy-in from the uh, founders right, is, uh, wouldn't, or rather the management, is not as difficult getting, than getting the buy-ins right, from the technical teams. Right? Uh, and uh, in Circles though, we have a very big engineering team. We have a very... Uh, and we have a very diversi diversified teams uh, with very smart people, right? So a lot of them have their own opinions. So it is uh, the job as an uh, infosec, right? Like one of the uh, panelists mentioned that we have to be a trusted advisor. I think it was David, right? Um, we have to be a trusted advisor. So th that is something that we are going on, uh, preaching in uh, circles with the various teams, right? To let them know that, hey, no, we are here to help you to make your job more efficient, better, and secure. So I, I think of it like, uh, I think security, info, information security as like a, a racing car. Right? The, the racing car, the uh, CEO is actually in the driving seat. Right? And the uh, various uh, functions in the racing car, like for example, the carburetor, the pistons, right? they are the different teams. Right? And where is security? Security is basically the brakes, right? the steering, right? and the tires. Right, to make sure that the uh, CEO, the founders, right, do not crash though, when they're in a race. Right, to make sure they're able to reach the finishing line, hopefully to reach the finishing line first than the rest of their competitors. Right. Well, Nordin, uh, totally agree with your first point, where it leads to my point as well. I mean, the biggest problem is uh, shadow IT operations and inside the threat. Yeah, like you said, data is everywhere and then uh, to, to achieve a full coverage is really tough. But uh, for Wheeler Bank, we are, we, are quite, uh, we are quite lucky because uh, we started up as a, a very small organization. Now we are growing bigger. And then uh, we don't have too much legacy stuff. So that's the best thing. And of course, we are trying to actually uh, work towards that, that coverage to reduce all these uh, shady IT operations and... Uh, all this inside the threat. So uh, uh, we are not a big team, but uh, we're really uh, doing all the functions that we are doing now. So, yep. All right. Thanks for that, guys. Um, I think uh, right at this point, we'll move on to the Q&A session. Um, there is one question in the chat, so I'm just going to go ahead and read it off. It's from Phoebe. Um, hi. I am sure you, many companies are facing difficulties to recruit and or retain a good in-house cybersecurity or information security officer within budget uh, doing such mar during such market conditions. Is it advisable to have an outsourced service provider to perform this function than rather than hiring a full-time staff within the company? What are the possible risks going down this route? And um, I'll just open up to anyone who wants to speak about it. Well, I can, I can take on this. Uh, because currently, we are working something called a critical service provider playbook. So um, the risk will be on the third party risk, where it's not your organization got hacked. Because a lot of uh, these organizations actually uh, 
put their customer data, put their all this uh, privacy stuff with the vendors. And what if they got hacked? So that's the problem. That's the risk you really have to look at if you really want to have a third party having uh, your personnel, your data. That's what you really need to look at. I mean, you have to prepare not only the cybersecurity team, but your PR, your legal, and, and teams like that. Because uh, when security incident occurs, they have to be at the front line to answer for that. So, and then that's, it's not like we didn't do our due diligence. It's like the vendors got hacked and then we really have to answer for them. So uh, if you really want to outsource these things, it's better to have this plan, uh, uh, these plans in place. I, I fully agree with uh, Samuel. Um, the most important thing about outsourcing your security function is uh, basically yeah, the data. That, and the problem is that when you outsource uh, the function, right, uh, you do not have control over how your data is being managed. Right, by your third party service provider. Even though that you have a third party uh, due diligence checklist, you, know, you go through all the checklists, you know, they can say from A to Z that they have everything. Right? But how do you actually go and ensure? You can't possibly be auditing them every day uh, because uh, let's say that you audit them uh, three months later. Well, they can change um, whatever they want to after that. right? And then uh, the next time that you're going to audit them again is uh, a year down the road. Oh, six months later. But what's happening between that third month and the, the next month, right? We do not know. Right? So that is uh, basically the number one risk that I would say. So I prefer to actually uh, keep our security function uh, in-house, right? Because uh, we are the one who uh, is ultimately responsible and accountable right, for the uh, security of the data. Right. Even if we say that, uh, to be honest with you, right, as a CISO, you say that, oh, security is everyone's responsibility. You know, everyone should be secure, uh, should, should uh, take security as their top priority. Uh, if you have an incident, if you have a data breach, uh, who they will find? They will definitely find the CISO and no one else. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, that's my take. Hmm. All right. Uh, there's a second uh uh, another question that's kind of related to this one as well. Um, so, uh, I, don't, I didn't get the name of the person asking, but um, the question is, what are the key differentiating factors you look for when, in, when evaluating a firm that provides cybersecurity software or services? I'll take that question. Um, usually, I think peer review is important, right? Uh, within your sectors, uh, or even back to your regulators. You know, when you talk to your regulators, they have a list of uh, uh, vendors that they recommend. Um, Gartner Report is another important source for me, right? Uh, as a reflection point, who are the leaders, who are the niche players, who are, you know, potential upcoming, right? Uh, very often we fall into um, a trap where uh, cost is driven, right? The decision is based on cost, all right? So try to strike a balance between these all right, when you do the necessary evaluation, right? That, that's, that's one important consideration. Yep. Okay. Um, um, yeah, more than you yep. want to. Yeah, if, if I may add, right, uh, with regards to uh, evaluation, yes, uh, number one is uh, definitely the cost, right? Because if it is above your budget, so no point finding that particular uh, vendor, right? So you have to make sure that it's within your budget. Uh, number two, um, I will have a couple of um, the same players, right? Um, the different vendors to come in, right? Um, and uh, share their uh, products and do demo, do the PLC, right? But most importantly, um, is about my use case. Right, how are uh, these products able to help me with my use case? Able to help me with uh, adding value to my organization. Uh, like I've mentioned just now, is about business <coughs> value, right? So if these products is just merely a technical uh, element, right, uh, to protect my organization uh, without uh, having uh, any form of business value, which, for example, uh may result to reputational or uh, financial uh, risk, then I don't see a point, right? So I want this product to be able to uh, not only 
uh, protect the organization, but add value to the organization and uh, reduce, uh, have an actual risk reduction uh, in that sense. I think um, I'd like to add to that as well. Um, just on the same point of um, making sure that it meets your business case, your use case, and adds value. I think a big thing about that is also being very clear, having a clear set of requirements, um, knowing what you want to get out of it, right? Um, that way, that can become the criteria that you use to judge all, all of the different vendors. Um, be sure about what you want um, when you get to the table. Correct, correct. Uh, because you see, um, for us, for all of us, right, I'm sure on LinkedIn, right, we receive a lot of uh, messages from vendors you know, promoting different products to us. I receive like countless of messages every day and I simply cannot respond to all of them, right? Um, and I cannot commit a time or a date uh, to talk to them because uh, when they show, so uh, typically, right, sometimes, you know, when we, we have been in the industry for some time. So we know uh, the context, no, we know the products. So we will, if we need something, so we will approach these vendors, right? But sometimes um, when vendors just approach us on LinkedIn and trying to pitch the product, to me is uh, a turn off, right? Uh, I may not have the use case for them. So they must find a better way of uh, trying to uh, gain my attention, you know, rather than just blasting it via LinkedIn and, uh, just ha and having a thesis uh, in that message telling me about their product and asking and when I go right down to the message telling, asking me for the date and time to meet, to meet up with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know all of us get a lot of those so those are the worst. Um, next question, uh, when should a startup have a security team? Should it be seed, series A or later? And how big or how much should you be spending on security at the different funding levels. Okay, I think I will take that since uh, mine is a startup, right? <laughs> Not like our big boys, no, from SPTEL and the bank. Um, okay, so um, I urge uh, you guys, right? When you have the CTO, make sure that you have a security guy, right? So the reason is because you do not, you if you only have a CTO, right? Trust me. Uh, if you have only a, a what do you call, no? head of IT, IT manager, CTO, uh, uh, digital uh, officer, whatever, right? So if you have only that, so you are focusing only on building the product and making sure that your operations are running effectively and smoothly, right? However, when you have a security guy together with the CTO, Right, together with your head of IT, he will be the one that is going to work hand in hand right, with IT to make sure that you are not only running smoothly, effectively, but also securely. That's number one. Number two, if you only have the um, security guy, the CISO, whatever you, know, you want to call it, you need to actually, uh, um, I have helped uh, a couple of uh, friends in companies to actually who are startups right to actually recruit uh, security security guys i i didn't because i know of they 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 are short in of in budget right so i don't tell them that okay no let's hire a CISO that is worth x amount of money right um why don't we hire um someone who can do cyber security a security specialist uh the the one who have at least five years of experience Right, so start with that first. Right, at least when you start with that, right, when you start with that, then later on, right, you can build up the team as your uh, company grows, as you have more and more workloads, right, then you can build it. Because if let's say that down the road you don't have a security guy and suddenly you are a big organization, right, with 500 users, you will and you start to and you think that, hey, no, maybe now is the right time for me to hire a security guy. Um, there will be a lot of problems because You'll now quit in five minutes. To, yeah, okay. So, so now we have to start yeah. from ground zero. You know, yeah. uh, to be honest with you. So, um, my suggestion is, if you want to have a security guy, start with someone who is more or less about five years of experience, have cybersecurity knowledge to help the CTO, head of IT security, to move together with the uh, operations and the product that you are developing. Yeah. Maybe I can share from the bank's perspective, because when I joined, it was, um, there was no security before this. So if uh, it depends on the business you're doing, uh, the regulators in Hong Kong have been doing a great job. 
where they actually uh, have a very high standard for cybersecurity. And then, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very good thing because uh, how do you make sure that people are confident enough to put their money into your bank? You have to make sure it's uh, secure. So that's why the regulators are doing a really great job on this. And they're beating us up, which I'm fine with that. But then uh, if you're going to be a startup, if your, if your business is going to involve money, we would advise that uh, you have a security team at the beginning of, the, of your startup. Then you have less problems for your IT departments because if you start without a security team and after, after a couple of months, you put in a new security guy and then that guy will have a lot of headache. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I think um, what, what, uh, to sum up what you guys are saying, it's never too early to start thinking about security. Never. Um, and, you know, um, like Norden said, it can just be a person who's very security minded. It doesn't have to be uh, a half a million dollar a year CISO or anything off the bat. Um, well, and also, I've been to your guys' awesome. is, uh, Circles Life, and you guys aren't really little guys. You guys got a, quite a big company going on, so... Um, not quite the little guys anymore. Um, uh, same person has a, a, a more tactical question for you guys. Um, on a more tactical level, um, what are your guys' thoughts on Zoom and how are you advising your business on virtual meeting platforms? Question. Uh, that is regardless of any meeting, virtual meeting platforms, Keep your software up to date, all right? Authorize software and 2FA. Uh, we, are using, yeah. we, we are actually using Zoom in the organization. And uh, obviously, you know, with uh, the news articles that were out uh, in the media, on LinkedIn, you know, wherever, right? Uh, people get uh, a bit uh, paranoid, right, with regards to, hey, no deal, no, are we still using Zoom? Uh, let's just use something else. So that, that's the thing, right, because when everyone is comfortable, you can't just, just simply say a few hundred people to stop using Zoom and uh, not uh, justify, right? So uh, as a security uh, uh, practitioner, right, so we have to look at uh, how can we better secure Zoom? So we look at the configurations, right? We look at the settings, you know, and we also come up with best practices and then we inform our users. Okay, so this is uh, what we will do you know, with regards to Zoom, right? And we have to assure them and at the same time come up, come up with a do's and don'ts uh, with regards to how you are using uh, Zoom. So my thing is that, uh, um, see, a lot of big companies are using Zoom. So they must have been doing something right. No, rather than you just uh, close the door. No, so as a security practitioner, I also want to mention that no, when um, a threat comes in, no, don't just simply straight away close the door. Right? Do your investigation right, uh, before you uh, make a decision. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're just about towards the end. I'm going to, I'm going to put, there's three, more, three or four more questions, but I'll, just pick one for the, the group to answer. Um, sorry if we didn't get you to your question. Um, the last one I'll post to the three of you is, um, it says Compl complacency leads to downfall. What are some proactive measures that can be taken to ensure the cybersecurity team and posture of the firm remains relevant in the constantly evolving threat landscape? Okay, let me take on, on that. Yeah, Samuel, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, let me take on that. Uh, what we are doing here in, in Relay Bank is we are doing a continuous rate teaming. It's not like we are uh, only uh, de depend on vendors, depend on, on um, third party. Uh, I have my team here doing rate team almost every day where we see any uh, uh, vulnerabilities, we will straight away report. So that stops us from being complacent and being in the comfort zone. So uh, we would suggest a continuous rate teaming, uh, which is fine with us because that's, that's our hobby. I will answer this question by saying that um, 
start from within, all right? Your cybersecurity team people are ready to empty the cup, all right? Very often we think that we know everything and anything. Uh, that is a false assumption. So uh, be ready to, to empty your cup and start towards continuous learning. I think that's, that's another aspect of it. Yep, um, that's actually a very good question, right? Uh, complacency, and uh, we do not want that to happen uh, not only within the information security function, but also the entire organization. So like, for example, in circles, right, we move at a rapid pace, we move, we are fast pace, right? So uh, in order for us to, um, as a security function, as a CISO, we know what we are supposed to do, right? Uh, the activities, the tasks that we are supposed to do, we know that, right? So I need to go into that. Uh, but what's most important is how are you actually keeping track of these action items, right? Uh, for us, we are very OKR-driven, uh, right? Uh, we have objectives and key results um, and 30, 60, 90 day plan. And um, we uh, make sure that uh, we try to, as much as possible, achieve our 30, 60, 90 day goals, right? To meet our strategic objectives. And we have uh, also daily stand-ups. Right? Our stand-ups are daily. It's not like we have a one hour meeting. Right. Uh, we have only have a 30 minutes uh, daily stand up whereby we meet uh, together as a team and uh, we just update each other on what's going on and uh, if there is any blocker. So we all know what we're supposed to do. So if there's any blocker, um, trash out during that meeting itself and then uh, update each other, then with we'll regards to a certain progress that uh, will be uh, hitting your objective or if you're not going to hit your objective, no, let everyone know. So by doing so, you know, everyone is actually keeping track of uh, their outcomes and they're on their toes. So you will avoid complacency in that sense. Great, great, great stuff, guys. Um, now we've come at the, we're, we're just past the top of the hour. So we're going to be wrapping it up. Um, I'm just going to go around and let everyone just have a quick um, closing remark, uh, starting with Samuel. All right. Um, as uh, we always say, uh, the more we, the more we sweat during peace, the less we bleed during war. So that's how I actually look at my cybersecurity team, and that's how we run Relapse Cybersecurity Team. So we we proactively uh, uh, improve ourselves, protect ourselves, and uh, like like we say, we do continuous rate teaming. We keep we keep beating ourselves up, and then to actually stay on top of things. In cybersecurity, you cannot be number one. You can say you're NSA, you're CIA, you're number one. No, they got hacked as well. So one last thing is, just don't be the last one. You should be okay. All right. David? Uh, so maybe I will finish off by saying, um, sometimes it may be very frustrating, whether it's on the security side of work or trying to translate cybersecurity term to business. Um, don't give up, you know. Uh, Keep going. Uh, sometimes you get rejected. You just got to pick up and move on, right? Stay positive. Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, Norden. Yeah. So I probably have said enough. Uh, so I'll be this short. Uh, and I'm fasting, so I'm actually very thirsty now. <laughs> so uh, I believe uh, we're in this journey together, right? Uh, so cybersecurity professionals should not work in silos. So I'm sure many of us are introverts, you know, and we are more than happy to be sheltered working from home. Know, managing and working with our teams uh, remotely. But it's important right, in this day and age that we collaborate and then we partner with the wider community, right? What, like what we are doing now and to combat security threats which are ever evolving. So we don't know what we don't know and we have to admit that, right? We will never be able to know everything, right? But by working together, right, I think we will learn how to make our organization a safe and secure place to work. All right, all right. Um, for those who didn't get their questions answered, I would encourage you to reach out to any of us on this panel. You should be able to get um, all of our um, contact details after the um, chat. So please, I encourage you to speak to us. I, we could talk about this stuff forever. We're kind of nerds about this stuff. We love it. Uh, so we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, also, um, uh, as part of Harangi, we'd like to thank uh, the speakers and all the attendees as well for um, joining us. Uh, if you're interested, uh, for those of you out there who are interested in checking out uh, the stuff we're doing in cyber strategy that we've uh, done for customers such as Gojek, Ticket, uh, and Funding Societies, uh, please check out vCISO and CSA on our website, harangi.com. And if you have any other uh, questions or you wanna reach out, 
You can also reach out to sales at harangi.com. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, thanks for uh, allowing that. Um, but yes, thank you again. Um, you guys have been really great. Uh, we look forward to the next one. So please, um, everyone stay tuned. Um, there's more coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Nice. Thank you.